Every year, the Economic Intelligence Unit releases the Democracy Index, and this index is to rank countries by how democratic they are. But how credible is it? The first thing we notice when we look into it is that the Democracy Index is put together by the same organization that owns The Economist magazine. This isn't an independent group of democracy researchers, it's an organization with its own ideological agenda, specifically the promotion of liberal capitalism. Of course, it would be unfair to write the Democracy Index off purely on the basis of who puts it together. And now that we've identified their potential bias, it is our job to examine whether or not the Democracy Index is compiled in a biased way, or whether it tries to be an objective measure of democracy itself. To do this, we'll be looking at the report they released in 2022, which contains its methodology as well as the conclusions that the researchers drew from the study as well. One of the first things we notice about the report is the sheer number of pages it devotes to the Russia-Ukraine war. There were many conflicts going on in the world in 2022. There was the Ethiopian Civil War, the continued attacks of the Israeli apartheid regime against the people of Palestine, the Civil War and Saudi bombing campaign in Yemen, and the fight against the military junta in Myanmar, to name a few. But The Economist picked out the Russian invasion of Ukraine as being so important to global democracy that it dedicated 11 of its 81 pages to the topic. Arguably, the fight of the Burmese people to overthrow the military junta and finally establish liberal democracy is as important, if not more important, in terms of global democracy than the war in Ukraine. And it must surely be a coincidence that the Ukraine war which is of such great interest to Western capitalism, is examined in great detail, while the Myanmar conflict is almost completely ignored. In the report's examination of democracy in Russia and Ukraine, we find our first example of the economist lying to push a political agenda. According to the report, a key difference between Russia and the former Warsaw Pact countries, such as the Czech Republic, or Poland is Russia never had any prior experience of democracy, except for a brief moment between February and October revolutions of 1917. This is a very strange statement. The economists might not approve of the model of democracy that existed in the Soviet Union. I'd be surprised if it did, but to deny that democracy existed in Soviet Russia is an outright lie. The economists can only do this by framing liberal style democracy as the only valid model of democracy. And we see explicitly when they said that Russia only had democracy for a brief moment between the February and October revolutions. This was the period where the constituent assembly existed. The constituent assembly was a parliamentary style democracy. The ideal model if you want capitalism to develop. But far from the only model of democracy available. If you want to see a video about how democracy was structured in the Soviet Union, you can find a link in the description. I'm not going to do a full debunking of the report's views on Russia and Ukraine, as that could fill a video of its own. But this was an important point to highlight, as it reveals the narrow way that The Economist is defining democracy when it compiles the Democracy Index. We'll see the theme reoccur again when we examine the criteria countries are judged on. But first, question time. Which continent is Mexico part of? If you said North America, every atlas and encyclopedia in the world would agree with you. But the Democracy Index wouldn't. To the Democracy Index, Mexico belongs to Latin America, while North America is only made up of only the United States and Canada, which, incidentally, it classifies as the most democratic region on Earth. If they consciously decided to split the Americas up into exploited and exploiters, they couldn't have done a better job. There doesn't seem to be any reason to leave Mexico out of the North American group, unless you decided beforehand that there's something which separates it from the rest of North America. Mexico is obviously less white, Spanish-speaking, 
and highly exploited by the United States. What's are always that are similar to other Latin American countries, and yet it's still part of North America. The citing to other it for Western readers is an ideological choice. It's a way of creating psychological distance between the rich white part of North America and the rest of it. The next issue that's worth highlighting is the way that The Economist gushes over U.S. democracy and its conclusions, which are all stacked at the front of the report before the methodology. To quote the report, the U.S. score for political participation remains among the highest worldwide, and it stands at its highest level since the Democracy Index first launched in 2006. American voters continue to exhibit strong political engagement. Turnout during the November 2022 midterm elections was among the highest on record, with nearly half of eligible voters casting ballots. It seems strange to highlight voter turnout when objectively the United States lags far behind many other nations in this regard. And according to information released by the Pew Research in 2022, the U.S. scored 31st in the world for voter turnout, which is hardly something to write home about. In fact, later on the report, the Democracy Index itself highlights the much higher voter turnout that it would expect to see than what it calls established democracies. A high turnout is generally seen as evidence of the legitimacy of the current system. And contrary to widespread belief, there is, in fact, a close correlation between the turnout and the overall measures of democracy. That is, developed, consolidated democracies have very few exceptions. Higher turnouts, generally above 70%, than less established democracies. Yet, the U.S. struggles to get voter turnout near that level for a presidential election. Never mind a midterm. There's another problem here as well, though. The Economist is presenting us with its findings that it established democracies have a 70% or higher voter turnout. But it actually drew this conclusion before it wrote the report. Question 27 in their test measures the turnout for national elections. With countries scoring the highest mark if they have over 70% voter turnout. So the conclusion that true democracies have a 70% or higher voter turnout is actually an assumption that's built into the test with countries that meet the standard receiving more points. Before we go on and examine the other criteria that the report used to rank countries in more depth, it's worth looking at the four groups it ranks countries into based on their scores. The first category are what it calls full democracies. These are countries in which not only basic political freedoms and civil liberties are respected, but also tend to be underpinned by political cultural conducive to the flourishing of democracy. The functioning of government is satisfactory. Media are independent and diverse, and there is an effective system of checks and balances. The judiciary is independent and judicial decisions are enforced. There are only limited problems in the functioning of these democracies. According to the report's definitions, flawed democracies have a little less of all this good stuff and the hybrid democracies have even less still. Then we get to the definition of authoritarian regimes, and oh boy, there are some ideological beliefs packed in here. According to The Economist, in these states, state political pluralism is absent, or it's heavily circumscribed. Many countries in this category are outright dictatorships. Some formal institutions of democracy may exist, but these have little substance and elections, if they do occur, are not free and fair. There's disregard for abuses and infringements of civil liberties. The media are typically state-owned or controlled by groups connected to the ruling regime. There is repression of criticism of the government and persuasive censorship. There is no independent judiciary. The problem with this definition is that it assumes that well-functioning democracies follow the model of liberal democracy. That means that some of the most democratic countries on earth, such as Vietnam or 
and Cuba, get classified as authoritarian regimes alongside autocracies like Saudi Arabia and Oman. If you did a double take at me calling Cuba and Vietnam highly democratic, then bear with me because I'm going to back up my claims. For now though, let's just say that socialist models of democracy look different from those that exist under capitalist states. If we base our understanding of what democracy is by looking at the surface level features of liberal democracy, we can end up misclassifying other democracies. In fact, over the last 17 years, the Democracy Index classifying these countries as authoritarian regimes has done a lot to promote the idea that these countries aren't democratic. Without further ado, let's dive into the questionnaire used to classify each country. There are a lot of questions, so I'm going to skip the uncontroversial ones and only bring attention to the ones that are problematic. As it would happen, the very first question in the survey is steeped in liberal bias. It asks whether elections are free, and we're told to score the country zero if it's a one-party state. On the face of it, this might seem uncontroversial, but actually defines democracy in a very limited way. It says any system that isn't a multi-party, liberal-style democracy is undemocratic by default. And to demonstrate why this is wrong, let's take a look at the way democracy functions in Cuba, which is a one-state party. On its lower level, Cuba is divided into 169 municipal districts, which oversee governmental economic and social activities. And within their territories in total, roughly 12,500 municipal seats available during each election. All voters are registered automatically and for free. And voting isn't a legal requirement, but takes place on a Sunday to make sure that the maximum number of people who want to participate are able to. Candidates aren't nominated by any political party and aren't allowed to put themselves forward for nomination, which makes it more difficult for those seeking power to chase public office. Instead, all candidates are nominated by the people in their communities. The elections themselves are funded by the government, with the candidates not allowed to accept donations or spend any extra money campaigning. The campaigning consists largely of candidates' profiles being posted up in windows around the neighborhood to tell voters about their character and their experience. Candidates aren't allowed to make any promises to voters about the policies they'll pursue once they're in office, eliminating the risk of candidates bribing their way into office with promises that they can't or won't deliver on. In order to get elected, a candidate must receive at least 50% of the votes. If nobody manages to achieve that in the first round of voting, then there's a runoff vote between the two candidates, who will receive the most votes in the first round. And this is in contrast to the plurality of voting that exists in places such as the UK, where a candidate in South Belfast won the right to become an MP with just 24.5% of the vote in 2015. So as we can see, despite Cuba being a one-party state, strong democracy exists at the municipal level. It merely takes a different form than seen in liberal countries. Some would argue it's a better form, one that keeps the money out of politics and puts the power in the hands of local community. Elections to the provincial and the national assemblies are structured a little differently. Candidates are put forward by the country's mass membership organizations, such as the Federation of Cuban Women, the National Association of Small Farmers, the Confederation of Cuban Workers, the Federation of Cuban University Students, the Federation of High School Students, and the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, which are the local neighborhood organizations. Almost all Cubans are members of at least one of these organizations, and many are members of multiple. Each candidate runs unopposed, but still has to receive at least 50%, yes, votes in order to be elected. 
and if they are rejected by the public, a more acceptable candidate has to be put forward. This system was set up to ensure that candidates from a wide variety of backgrounds get elected to national and provincial positions. As a result, it is common for women, young people, racial minorities, and queer people to have seats in the National Assembly. Most politicians aren't paid for their work in Cuba, which minimizes the risk of corruption in the nomination process. Even National Assembly members still keep their regular jobs while doing their work as politicians for free. So to sum up, the candidates are either put forward by their neighbors or by mass membership organizations that represent most Cubans. Voter registration is free and automatic. Candidates aren't allowed to spend money on campaigning and aren't allowed to try and bribe voters with policies and promises. There's no financial incentive for people to chase public office and no candidate is elected with less than 50% of the vote. We might ask whether there are better models of democracy than the one in Cuba, the practices. But to say that democracy doesn't exist in Cuba, simply because it's a one-party state, is absurd. Yet the Democracy Index criteria requires us to score it a zero for this question, solely on that basis. The next question the Democracy Index asks is whether elections are fair. However, it says that if a country scored zero, in the last question, then we should score it zero here too. It doesn't matter that in Cuba, for example, all vote counting is overseen by volunteers. It happens publicly in the community where voting took place. If the country is a one party state, we have to score it zero. The scoring for this question has nothing to do with whether or not elections are fair and everything to do with whether the country follows the liberal style multi-party competition system. The next concerning question is the number seven. Is the process of financing political parties transparent and generally accepted? There's a big problem with this. Widely different forms of financing political parties can be accepted once they become normalized in a society. In a society such as Cuba, for instance, the introduction of private financing into election campaigns would cause an outcry. Whereas in the US, people are so used to candidates spending billions of dollars on campaigns that it's generally accepted, even if most people would like it to be different. So hopefully you can see the problem with this. In some countries, candidates can be financed by private interests who use that leverage to gain favors. And this undermines the very idea of democracy. And yet it can be generally accepted because it's become normalized. So even a country like the US or the UK can score full marks on this question, despite political candidates being beholden to moneyed interests. Next, we have question nine. Are citizens free to form political parties that are independent of government? Again, we have the built-in assumption that a democracy has to be a system of multi-party competition. It's the same in question 10, which asks, do opposition parties have a realistic prospect of achieving government? That's another zero for the non-liberal countries. We're only a sixth of the way through questions, and it's already clear that the criteria are designed to promote liberal-style, competitive, multi-party democracy as the only legitimate kind. Question 25 is another interesting one, not because of the question itself, but because of the scoring criteria. The question asks about the level of public confidence in government with a country being awarded the highest marks if the public has 40% or more confidence in the government. Anything between 25 and 39% will get a country half marks, and anything below that earns a zero. When there are governments in the world with a trust rating from their citizens of over 80%, setting the bar at 40% seems very low indeed. But what this low bar does is allow countries such as Germany, Canada, US, France, Australia to score full marks, instead of being outscored by China, 
In China, the level of trust in government was 89% in 2022. But not to worry, the US scored just as many points in democracy index service with its unimpressive 42% trust level from its citizens. That means the US is receiving the same marks, even though the US citizens trust their government at less than half the rate the Chinese people trust theirs. Some will argue that countries like China don't count because they're so-called authoritarian regimes, which supposedly brainwash their citizens. But if the answer to this question isn't actually helpful in determining which countries are democratic, why is it in the survey? A fact is that independent research shows that Chinese citizens trust their government more than twice as much as US citizens trust theirs. If the economist thinks that trust in government is a valid indicator of democracy, it should be scoring this question impartially, not setting the scoring criteria at a level where the underperforming liberal democracies can get full marks. The next question pulls the same trick when it asks about trust in political parties and sets the bar so low that countries with wildly different trust levels the same. Then we're on to something quite different. Questions 37, 38, and 39 ask whether a country's citizens think that the country should be run by a strong leader who can bypass parliament, whether it should be run by the military and whether it should be run by experts rather than politicians. Obviously, if citizens believe these things, it's a sure sign that they don't have faith in their country's process for electing politicians and distributing power to them. What's interesting about these questions is the scoring criteria, though. For the question about whether society should be run by a strong leader who can bypass parliament, a country scores full marks if under 30% agree with this. But for the question about whether the military should run a society, a country gets full marks if it's under 10% of the population that agree. For whether society should be run by experts, the threshold is 50%. The report doesn't give any justification for scoring criteria of the questions, so we can only guess as to the economist's reasoning. Looking at the World Value Survey data the report based its scoring on, it seems like they just took the average and chose a slightly lower number when awarding the full marks. 33.3% of people globally said that it was good to have a strong leader who could bypass parliament and elections. So the economists at the bar at 30. 22.7% said the military should rule their country. So the economists set the bar at 10%. And 56.1% globally said the experts should run the country rather than elected politicians. So the economists set the bar at 50%. There are worse ways to score these questions, I guess, even if it does feel arbitrary. But when a full 49.9% of the population wants experts to run the society instead of elected officials, it seems weird to give the country full marks for democracy. Question 44 and 45 ask whether there is free electronic and print media. Countries are supposed to be marked down if media ownership is diverse, but government controlled media is heavily favored, or if there's a high concentration of private ownership. The clear inference is that the media only serves democracy well when it's privately owned, but hasn't formed into monopolies. There are some problems with this line of reasoning, however. It doesn't matter how many separate capitalists own the news media. They're always going to promote the same range of pro-capitalist views. And politicians, no matter the opinions of the electorate. Pew Research has found that 36% of people in the U.S. held a favorable view of socialism in 2022. Yet how much of the U.S. news coverage spreads favorable views about socialism? Is it anywhere near 36%? Not even close. But according to a 2016 book, Who Owns the World's Media, the U.S. has some of the least concentrated ownership of news media in the world. The truth is, spreading out the ownership of media amongst a larger group of capitalists doesn't result 
having media that accurately reflects the views of the majority, or which promotes their interests. The media in every country promotes a worldwide view that benefits the class which controls it. State-aligned media in Russia promotes the worldview that it helps oligarchs, while state-controlled media in China promotes the socialist worldview. And since it's a worker-controlled socialist state, it's not the diversity of ownership in media that changes the interests that it promotes. It's the class of character, the actors, who control it. China and Cuba are as likely to let liberals spread pro-capitalist propaganda in their state media as the privately owned New York Times or the Daily Mail are to let Marxist-Leninists spread communist talking points in their pages. The other issue with these questions about media ownership is that they presuppose that capitalism is necessary for democracy. Without capitalism, there can be no private ownership of the media, let alone diverse ownership. So to conclude all of this, The Economist tries to pretend that Democracy Index is a neutral assessment of democracy around the world. While actually there's a strong ideological bias to its ranking, it strongly favors liberal democracy and penalizes other models of democracy. By and large, the liberal media lets them get away with this deception by never examining the nature of the Democracy Index when they report on its findings. Its bias isn't surprising, though. Given that The Economist is a longtime propaganda tool for liberal capitalism, in 1915, Vladimir Lenin famously called the magazine a journal that speaks for the British millionaires. In a world where capitalism is increasingly in crisis, however, in a world of climate collapse, rising fascism, and profit rates falling towards zero, unquestioning acceptance of liberal propaganda is something that none of us can afford to do. Unless we want to see society collapse. Okay, guys, that's the end of the video. Remember to like and subscribe for more socialist analysis, and let us know what you think in the comments below. Until next time.